Hollow Knight is a remarkable achievement in both story and game design. Its narrative is incredibly interesting as it forces you to uncover the secrets of the world yourself, while also having a large cast of characters that, for the most part, are delightful to talk to. But it also has a couple issues regarding its method of storytelling as some of its story is strangely not in the game but in other material, and it has one DLC that almost ruins the original story that the game built up. We'll talk about all that in due time though, as this video will not only explain the story of Hollow Knight so that you know what's going on in the Hollow Nest, but I'll also be critiquing it along the way. I have a lot of things to say about this game, so let's not waste any time, and let's get started. The game starts with a cutscene of a being locked inside some device. An orange glow appears and seems to crack something before showing another scene but of our protagonist, the knight. Sadly, we aren't given any information following this as we start playing immediately after. The path we start on will take us to a town called Dirtmouth, with its only resident being the Elderbug, who greets us upon our arrival. From his dialogue, it seems like we aren't the first people to arrive here, and we certainly won't be the last. He also assumes we only came here to visit the Eternal Kingdom, known as Hollow Nest. From there, he tells us that the entrance to this underground kingdom is down the well right outside the town. Afterwards, uh, that's it. That's all he says. Hollow Knight makes it pretty clear right away that its story is pretty vague. We technically don't have a quest or objective or even a motivation to be here. Hell, we just found out what the kingdom is called. This might seem like a bit much as it's quite bold for the devs to just throw the player into the world and then refuse to give them a reason as to why they're even here. But while the game refuses to elaborate on anything, I'll say that at the very least, there is a reason for the knight being here specifically, as their birth and destiny are tied to this place, but that's something we'll have to talk about later. Fortunately, while the story is too shy to introduce itself just yet, the gameplay is more than happy to make your acquaintance. Hollow Knight is a Metroidvania and is one of the few games on this channel I would recommend for purely the gameplay alone. The story was really the cherry on top of all this as the gameplay is fantastic. There is a lot to go over regarding the gameplay, but basically you'll be exploring all the hallways, dead ends, and crevices of the Hollow Nest so you can uncover its secrets. This fits quite well regarding the story as presumably both the knight and the player have no idea what they're doing here, and by exploring this kingdom they might just find the answer. Along the way, you'll also get Geo, the game's currency, as well as find some charms you could slot into notches to increase your power. These range of things like extra damage and more health to more situational things like having Geo come to you instead of just scattering all over the floor, or shrinking your size when healing, making it harder to hit you. There are also a ton of items hidden throughout the map, like keys, rancid eggs, and upgrade materials. Some plays even have the ability to grant you spells or passive abilities like dashing or double jumping. Plus, in true Metroidvania style, whole areas are walled off until you get these items, or even smaller sections of already accessible areas, meaning you'll have to be backtracking constantly. Hollow Knight will also try to challenge the player in numerous ways, by either giving them hard bosses or by adding platforming puzzles to it as well. But even if this proves too easy for you, upon completing the game you're given access to a Steel Soul mode, which is basically a permadeath challenge where you have to beat the whole game without failing as dying deletes your save. Like I said, there is a lot to Hollow Knight's gameplay, but it is wonderful, as not only do I think the charm system is what really brings us all together, but there is a surprising amount of depth to the gameplay as well. Hollow Knight's gameplay really was great to mess around with and experience, which is quite important for a game like this, given that the next 5-8 to eight hours are filled with back-to-back -back combat encounters without much development in the story. So it really needs to hook you in immediately, and fortunately for the game, it did right away. Earlier I talked about Hollow Knight's level design and how it's all connected, requiring the player to backtrack throughout the levels. This makes talking about the story difficult, as there really isn't a proper place to start. For example, a game that we talked about before that is also getting a sequel in a couple weeks that I plan to talk about, Blasphemous, had a well-paced and structured story. You were told by the first person you meet to find the three humiliations. Originally, you were locked off to the first half of the map, but once you found those three humiliations, the second half would be open to you until you reach the end. Hollow Knight doesn't really do this, as a large portion of the game is just spent finding the actual objective and then doing it, and then once that's complete, you're onto the final boss. It's a bit of an odd way to structure a story, and definitely makes my job harder as I prefer to organize things a bit, but fortunately, a part of Hollow Knight's story that isn't explained is the exploration itself. Walking around Hollow Nest, meeting with NPCs, exploring new locations, all of it is the story, as exploring the kingdom will eventually lead you to some interesting locations that further develop the actual story and the ending. Hollow Knight is both a story about Hollow Nest and the Knight's journey in uncovering what happened in Hollow Nest, and I really like this take on the storytelling, as being thrust into an unknown land without explanation forces the player to seek out answers to their own questions. The game never says in the beginning that Hollow Nest fell to ruin and is a shell of its former self. You ask the questions, then you find the answer. Why is Hollow Nest filled with different kinds of bugs? Why are some locations built differently than others? Where did it all go wrong? Just like the gameplay, Hollow Knight's story allows the player enough freedom to express themselves, most of the time, you get in what you put out. If you want to learn about Hollow Nest, then you'll find the answers to your questions, but if you don't want to engage with its world, then you won't get anything out of it. 
This not only satisfies the kinds of players who enjoy games for the gameplay as they don't need to be forced into a story they don't care about, but dare I say it, it kind of brought me back to Dark Souls 1. Exploring Dark Souls 1 for the first time and simultaneously figuring out my own purpose in this world while also figuring out how it all came to be is one of the best experiences I've ever had playing a game before, and Hollow Knight sort of encapsulates that feeling. I honestly never thought I would say that before, but it's true. Learning about Hollow Nest and its residents while trying to understand the knight's role in all this was exactly how I felt when I stepped into Lordram for the first time, and I'm genuinely impressed. Sadly, as I said before though, there really isn't a definitive objective in this game, as the objective for now is to find that objective. Thankfully the game is willing to feed us a breadcrumb trail of mystery until we get there, as while exploring the Hollow Nest you'll come across quite a few peculiar things. The first is this Black Egg Temple located in the Forgotten Crossroads. Its design is similar to the one in the intro, so clearly this place might house that orange glow we saw earlier. Sadly, we can't open it though as there seems to be a lock on it, so we'll have to come back once we find the keys. During our travels, we'll also meet a few NPCs like Elderbug, Zote, Hornet, and the Hunter. While they're all great in their own way, it's their designs I'm more interested in. Hollow Nest is filled with all kinds of insects and bugs, from mantises to jellyfish to bees, yet among them are a few bugs that look like our knight. At the time, it could be assumed that the knight is one of a kind, or is from somewhere else, but there are quite a few bugs that have similar head shapes. Zote is the best example of this, as he looks identical to the knight minus the face. Hornet is less so, but she like the knight has a white mask of sorts, and this kind of design is only seen on a few creatures. This gives the player the impression that the knight might have originated here, although at the moment it's just speculation. The hunter, on the other hand, doesn't look anything like the aforementioned NPCs, but he serves another purpose, as upon meeting him he'll give the player a journal. This journal is basically a bestiary of all the enemies we come across on our journey, but after killing a certain amount, new text starts to appear, which may give some answers as to what these bugs are. Admittedly, it's not all helpful, as most of it seems to be written from the perspective of the hunter himself, who always takes the chance to insult the beings we kill, but sometimes his words can be useful. Talking to NPCs, reading the hunter's journal, and discovering these stone writings I call lore tablets are the core pillars that make up Hollow Knight's source of information, and thanks to these, we're able to learn quite a bit about the bugs here. The first group of individuals you'll come across are the husks. These are your standard enemy, but they do come in a variety of shapes and sizes. This group is seen in places like the Forgotten Crossroads, the Crystal Peak, and the City of Tears. Judging from the locations we find them in, we can assume that the City of Tears is a place for the wealthy, and the Forgotten Crossroads is more for the poor and middle class, while the Crystal Peak sort of acts as a source of power for the kingdom. The crystals located here have a faint amount of soul in them, which are a part of the life essence of all bugs in Hollow Nest, so they're quite valuable to the kingdom. As for the other settlements though, many of the husks within the City of Tears are extremely wealthy due to them being ordained in beautiful clothing and jewelry, along with the fact that they drop more geo when killed. Some of the residents seem to even be trying to capitalize on the downfall of the kingdom by making a quick buck. As this sweet grandma named Milaba will hold your geo for you in her bank, but after enough time will run off with it. That is until you confront her and get it back. The City of Tears also got its name thanks to it being built under the Blue Lake, which is where the rain comes from. Funny enough, I never found it odd or even bothered to wonder why it rained here even though the entire kingdom is underground. Although given that this place has jellyfish, fungal mushrooms, acid water, and a literal pool of darkness, I guess the thought never crossed my mind. Regardless, not much else is mentioned about these places, but there are a few signs pointing towards the City of Tears like it's some kind of pilgrimage. And seeing as this place is considered the heart of the kingdom, it's no wonder many people revered it and thus took great strides to get here. But that pilgrimage may have been an unintended death trap for many, as located at the top of the city is the Soul Sanctum. And various lore descriptions point to the scholars here using the citizens of the city in various experiments. They seem to have been a normal group of scholars looking to harness the powers of the mind, but after an infection swept through the kingdom, they attempted to stop it using the power of soul. Soul, as I said, is considered the life force of all life in Hollow Nest, so in order to gain more soul, the scholars took to the streets and kidnapped or outright killed many of its residents, and then dumped the bodies at the bottom of the sanctum. To make matters worse, not only did many of their experiments fail, as these blob-like beings are the results of their failed tests, but it didn't seem to produce any worthwhile results anyway, as no information can be gleaned from their testing and none of the scholars are alive to tell us what they uncovered. It's a pretty gruesome story to say the least, but it's one of the stronger ones within Hollow Knight, as it provides a wealth of knowledge on the city and its inhabitants, in addition to the added intrigue that comes from a place such as this. Fortunately, this intrigue also carries over into the next area called the Green Path, which is run by the Mosskin tribe. What might surprise you about them though is that the Mosskin aren't too interested in the kingdom's ruler or their people. Hollowness was created by the Pale King who rules over its land along with his queen, the White Lady, but not all the groups live in harmony. The Mosskin don't hate the Pale King and his people, but they don't really care for them either. They seem to just merely tolerate them, as they allowed people to come into their land and even build roads on them, but warn them not to stray too far off the paths they built. 
To many of the bugs in Hollow Ness, the Pale King can be seen as a god. In fact, this is true in more ways than one, as he's what the game calls a higher being. The Pale King came here from a distant land and decided to create a kingdom for his eventual subjects to live in. According to various lore tablets, he was also able to grant the bugs sapience, allowing them to think instead of act on instinct. Not all the bugs have this, as some of the enemies in this game are sort of like animals in the real world, but most of the bugs were granted this power by the Pale King. That's why the creatures of this kingdom can even talk in the first place. This power also only seems to extend to Hollow Nest, as a few more lore tablets in the outskirts of the kingdom warn us that leaving its grounds will basically make us lose the powers we were given. That's kinda why I like the intro of the game despite it not giving us a reason to do anything, because the knight likely lost their memory of Hollow Nest, or at least doesn't have any cognitive thought until approaching its gates. We don't know what Hollow Nest is or what we're doing here because the knight doesn't even know either. The both of us are just kinda going with the flow at this point, and while I was skeptical at first, I started to appreciate why the dev team was so secretive at the start. Back to the Mosskin, they knew of the Pale King's existence, but unlike other bugs, didn't worship him as they worship something called Un. Un is another higher being in the game, one of which the Mosskin believes created them and their land. We do actually get to meet this Un though, but the conversation is... well, quite hard to call a conversation. Great talk, Un. Thanks. Your people are definitely not in desperate need of your arrival or anything, but, uh, thanks for the charm. Yeah, Un isn't very talkative and also seems to not be responding to her people's call, as a lot of the dialogue implies that she's not answering them. This actually seems to have led some of the Moskin to turn their backs on Un and worship something they call the Light. This might not mean much now, but it's kind of interesting to see how early the foreshadowing started here. Near the Green Path is our next location, the Queen's Garden, which not only houses the Moskin, but also the Mantis tribe. They're a bit hard to pin down at first, as they also have their own village in the Fungal Waste, and that's because the group was split due to an altercation. The mantises we find in the Queen's Garden are called the Traitors. This is because of that infection I briefly mentioned earlier. It somehow managed to find its way into the Mantis Village, but fortunately for them they're able to resist its effects unlike the rest of the kingdom. Unfortunately though, not everyone was too keen on just letting this thing exist without at least looking into it. And after some time, members of the tribe began to embrace this infection. This led to a dispute between some of the higher-up members of the tribe, which resulted in those that embraced the infection being forced to leave the village. The one thing they both agree on, though, is that they don't care about the Pale King either. Whereas the Mosskin tolerated their new neighbors, the Mantises refused to join up with them. At most, they entered a truce with the Pale King that said that they wouldn't be involved in their way of life, but would keep the Deep Nest and its monsters away from the rest of the kingdom. The reason why is that the Deep Nest houses quite a few other species that also aren't too keen on visitors either. The Deep Nest is home to the current species, the Spider Tribe, and a long-forgotten group called the Weavers. We don't know too much about the Weavers, as they left the Deep Nest some time ago thanks to that aforementioned infection sweeping the land. This place also seems to be quite primitive, even though one of its inhabitants claimed that this place is the home to the most intelligent species in the world, although that's likely just bias on her end. This seems to be a bit of a recurring theme here, but another group of individuals that also rejected the Pale King's rule are the Bees of the Hive. They went as far as wand themselves off from the rest of the kingdom, as the only way to access their hive is through secret breakable walls. Thanks to their seclusion though, we aren't able to learn much about them, but we do know that their queen grew so large she was unable to leave the hive, ultimately ending in her death, which is why the hive is in such disarray when we arrive. This pretty much covers the main tribes and locations of Hollow Nest, but we haven't even scratched the surface yet. There are both whole tribes and important members of the previous tribes that I intentionally left out thanks to them being more important to the main story, Entire areas I left out for the same reasons, and some other things just due to the lack of importance like the flukes and the mushrooms, but even without them we've already learned so much about this place. Every inch of this kingdom is filled with stories for the player to uncover, and it's what makes Hollow Knight such a fascinating game to play, as you're essentially collecting puzzle pieces that will eventually create the puzzle that is Hollow Knight. Plus, given the genre of this game, most of this info will be fed to you throughout the playthrough, so you might not be able to learn everything about a single location or tribe in one visit. It's this constant cycle of finding information and being interested enough in what you found to go look for more, and it's these moments where Hollow Knight is at its best. Like I said, most of the time what you put in is what you get out, and Hollow Knight's biggest strength is giving the player a wealth of information to find should they choose to. I say most of the time though, is not everything is answered, and that's one of the sore spots of this game. I don't have an issue with the game not telling you things, it's where that information comes from. Alongside Hollow Knight were a few pieces of external media that being an official manual, a prequel comic, and something called the Wanderer's Journal. Quite a bit of this game's story can be found here and only here. A great example would be the Hive. Everything I mentioned about the Hive was not found in the game. 
At the time I had gone through the whole hive and came out with nothing, which was bizarre given every other location was the complete opposite. So I looked it up just to make sure I didn't miss a secret room or anything, only to discover that I was destined not to find this information had I not looked it up. The only dialogue of note in the hive comes from the ghost of Queen Vespa herself. All she says is a thank you for setting her night free from the torment of the infection, and that the hive plays no part in Hollowness perpetuation. However, we know that there is more to this, but that's because it comes from the other sources. The official manual says that the hive was a tribe that walled themselves off from the Pale King. It also states that Queen Vespa grew too big and died because of it. To make things even worse, we learn that the reason that the hive is in such disarray is because the infection was able to overpower the beast thanks to their queen dying. But we only know of that information thanks to an Ask Me Anything Reddit thread. Now I've played games before that answer questions and things like books and movies, but a Reddit thread is definitely a new one for me. None of this information is in the game, as the only dialogue in the area comes from the queen, and the Hunter's Journal also provides no further insight either. Even the one thing that could have been interesting, which is the fact that the bees also have beehives with husks in them, is used as a way to make a joke. As the Hunter's Journal says, quote, Did the husks squeeze in the hive, or did the bees build their nests around them? Either way, they seem pretty happy together. This is a group that walled off its borders from everyone else, yet has husks from Hollow Nest in their domain, and it's not brought up at all? Look, I can see how some people might find this interesting, as in a way it's sort of like its own scavenger hunt to find all this external info, but you have to understand that that last piece of info would not have been known had it not been for the person who asked that question and for one of the devs who responded. Had the team simply decided that they weren't in the mood to answer more questions or even do the thread at all, this would not have been known. And realistically, is the hive important to the story of Hollow Knight? Not really, which is an issue in and of itself, as it's probably the least developed and interesting location in the whole game. But I feel like adding in basic information should have been a top priority here. I have no issue with the game refusing to answer certain things about its world. But not including something as basic as why the place exists, or how it came to be the way that it is in the present day is bizarre, as almost every other location doesn't do this, and gladly provides you with enough information to either tell you what happened, or at least give you hints as to what could have happened. Regardless, that's probably my biggest issue regarding Hollow Knight's storytelling, as yes, while Hollow Knight can be a hard game to piece together, it's quite annoying to actually put in the work to learn about this game, without knowing that you won't ever find certain info thanks to the team deciding that a book or journal was a better place for it to be even though most players likely didn't buy this or even know that it exists in the first place. Within the many locations of Hollow Nest, there are also dozens of residents that the Knight can talk and interact with. The NPCs of Hollow Knight are another core part of the exploration, as you're able to learn quite a few things about the kingdom from them, while also occasionally embarking on quests with them as well. That said, they are an 80-20 split, ranging from fantastic to borderline pointless. A great example of the latter would be Emilicia. You'll find her lounging around the upper parts of the City of Tears, and from talking with her we can see that she's laughing at the current state of the city, as the same people who cast her out of Hollow Nest High Society are now the mindless husk wandering around aimlessly. Outside of this one detail though, she's completely useless. Returning to her doesn't add anything, and even when you come back with specific items like the delicate flower or the king's branch, she only makes a quick remark and that's all. She also doesn't provide anything for the purposes of gameplay, except the fact that her room can be used as a quick shortcut to the royal waterways, but I never found much use for it. Another example would also be Willow, this tall creature relaxing in the Queen's Station. All of her dialogue centers around her eating the food here, and even now she wants to eat the knight, but knows that they won't let her. Willow is arguably worse though, as unlike Emilicia, you can't come back to get new dialogue. You can listen to everything she says the moment you meet her, as having specific quest items won't give you more dialogue. Furthermore, she also doesn't provide any services that will assist with gameplay unless you count the one sellable item hidden above her. On the complete other side of the spectrum in terms of quality though, we have someone like Zote. You find him in the Forgotten Crossroads being eaten by a Vengefly King. Once you kill the beast, instead of Zote thanking you, he scolds you for taking his kill. Zote immediately comes off as an asshole, and this continues throughout his entire questline. He'll end up getting caught again in the Deep Nest, and not only does he not remember you, but he also talks about his recent exploits, such as killing a flying beast. Meaning in addition to getting mad at us for saving him, he also takes credit for the kill. This all comes to a head at the Coliseum of Fools, a fighting arena within Hollow Nest where the final boss of the first trial is Zote, and not only is he incredibly easy, he can't even damage you. Not even contact damage, something the literal weakest enemies in the game can do doesn't even affect you. It's a therapeutic experience, as you could finally take your anger out on him for the number of times he's berated you. But somehow Zote's schemes know no bounds, as if you defeat him in the Coliseum, but also save another bug called Breda in the Fungal Waste, she falls in love with Zote instead of you as he regals her about his recent killings while holding the helmet of an enemy we defeated. Breda is head over heels for the knight, that she sees them as her knight in shining armor, and even writes a few poems about us, but now all her attention is on Zote. 
if you're really annoyed with him at this point, you can fight his dream version called Grey Prince Zote, which after enough time will cause her to lose interest in him, but it's an amazing questline regardless. Now obviously the reason for this stark difference in quality is the fact that Zote has an actual questline that the player can complete, unlike a Militia or Willow, but that doesn't automatically make him a fantastic NPC. As some characters have questlines but are also not interesting to me, while others have none but were some of my favorite bugs to talk to. Tiso is a great example of an NPC with a questline that still managed to lose my interest as they're basically a poor man's zote. Tiso arrives in Dirtmouth at one point and talks about wanting to fight people. They'll also appear near the Blue Lake and on a bench near a stag station and constantly remark how pitiful or boring these things are. Eventually Tiso will find their way to the Colosseum, but unlike Zode, you can actually find their corpse falling from the Colosseum like the dozens of others before him. We never actually get to see Tiso fight, and the one time we actually could fight him, which is in a future DLC, they pull a fake out and have him be crushed by the actual boss of the Pantheon. Admittedly, that last part did get a chuckle out of me, but Tiso's quest is confusing as he has two reasons for existing, at least that I can think of, but neither of them led anywhere interesting to me. If Tiso was meant to be a warrior that is in over his head and despite talking up a big game is actually really weak, then they really are a discount zote. But if in a roundabout way he's used to convey how dangerous the Colosseum is as someone as experienced as Tiso couldn't even survive, then that doesn't work either as we don't know how strong Tiso actually is. We never see him fight throughout the entirety of the game or even see the remnants of a fight. They just talk about fighting and then die. At least with Zoe we could see how incompetent he was from the two times we see him, which makes his fight even better as while the player likely knew he was weak, they probably didn't know he was that bad. On the other side of the coin though, there are quite a few NPCs I grew to like due to their personality or the relation to other characters yet didn't have any questlines at all. Two of which I want to specifically highlight are Cornifer and Myla. They are probably the two most likable NPCs in the whole game. Both of them don't have a questline, but talking with them always felt nice. Myla is just a bug who mines away in the Crystal Peak. Right away she comes off as extremely likable as she's pleased to make your acquaintance and is very happy to see you again if you return to her. Most of her dialogue is also lines from a song she slowly starts to remember over the course of the game until the infection returns and overcomes her, forcing the player to flee or to put her down. I didn't visit Myla much in my playthrough, but any time I came to the Crystal Peak, I always made sure to say hi even if it was repeated dialogue, as I grew to like her delightful personality. Similar to Myla, Cornifer is also extremely friendly right from the start, as you and him both have a common obsession with exploring unknown lands. You don't meet Cornifer much outside of these occasional talks with him, but it was nice to know that someone else was going through these areas with me, and meeting with him to talk about our adventures was always nice to hear. Eventually, once you buy all of his maps, Cornifer will return to his wife Iselda's house and sleep for the remainder of the game. She's also a good example of a character that's likable due to their relationship with another NPC. I liked Cornifer, so clearly I'm going to like his wife. And while she didn't add much to the conversation, you do learn that she used to be a fighter until she settled down with him a few years ago. She also plans on asking if she can come with him on their next adventure, as his tales about the Hollow Nest got her interested to see what her husband's been up to. Once again, it doesn't take a whole lot for me to enjoy the company of a character, and Myla and Cornifer are great examples of that, as their personalities were infectious enough for me to care about them from the moment I met them. As I mentioned earlier, Hollow Knight's NPCs can be a mixed bag, but overall there is a lovely cast of characters here that all attempt to add something to the game, even if it's small. Even though some of them weren't too interesting by the end, I was at least curious to see how they would develop once I met them. Plus, all this ties back into the game's core idea of exploration, as you'll never know what you'll find around each corner. Many of the NPCs carry with them this sense of mystery, as you wonder where things will go next, and this even extends to the ones we didn't mention. Like how the Nail Masters are all brothers who trained under Nail Sage Sly, but they all separated as two of the brothers have a strenuous relationship, possibly due to something in their past. Or the Nailsmith, the one who upgrades our gear, who ends up asking us to kill him as they've completed their life's work, but will end up living with one of the Nail Masters if we choose to spare them. Then there's Cloth, who's on the search for stronger foes but ends up dying at the end of their questline, which is sad until you realize that it seems like they wanted this to happen, as they were trying to meet with someone called Nola who seemed to have died long ago. Even as someone as irrelevant as the Grubfather carries some mystery with them, as all his children have been presumably taken by this being known as the Collector, who is also another topic of mystery as they seem to be related to the King's Mold Guards that guard the Pale King's Chambers as a mold of its body is found in one of the rooms. But the Collector seems to want to save them, either because they have a fascination with these creatures or maybe they don't want them to die. Because if you rescue all the Grubs, we find out that the Grubfather ate them all, but even that is mysterious because the Grubfly Elegy Charm could be what the Grubfather is going to turn into, or maybe the Grubfather is like the Gru's mother boss fight, and is being used as some kind of cocoon in order to evolve his children. Not everything will lead to an answer, but not only is this part of the game's charm, as most of the time there's enough info given to at least speculate on what could happen, 
But the tribes, tablets, enemies, NPCs, and locations are all things you can find, and no matter how small they are, each will create some kind of new and exciting experience for you to enjoy. While Hollow Nest has its fair share of history for us to learn, much of which we've already talked about, something that's been quite consistent among most of its history has been the mentioning of a widespread infection. This infection is why Hollow Nest is in the shape that it's in. Something you may have thought about while exploring the kingdom is why everyone's trying to kill us. Are they simply protecting their people? Are we some kind of killer to these people? Are their minds overcome with an infection that regressed them back to their old thoughtless states before the Pale King's arrival? Did I just spoil the entire plot? Well, that's what we're going to find out. As while the game never tells you to search for clues about the infection, there are enough things that showcase or talk about it that it's hard to ignore. The real beginning of the story starts with our meeting with Hornet. We first see her in the green path as she moves out of our view right when we get close. When we finally catch up to her, we see that she's killed another bug that looks similar to us. This event forces us to question what's going on here, and while not technically true, my first thought was that Hornet was tracking us down and killing our people. And this was basically all but confirmed the moment she started to fight me after our talk. I started to question Hornet and her role in the story though, as the next time we meet her is at the City of Tears in the town statue. As we approach, Hornet will come to greet us, but unlike last time, she's just here to talk. Which is followed up by her saying that if we want to know the truth, we should keep searching, and if by then we still want to continue the plan, then we must seek out the grave in Ash and find the mark buried there. It's about as vague as you could possibly get, but at least we know we're on the right track. Much of her dialogue about the past of this kingdom though has to do with the statue right next to us. It's a memorial for THE John Hollow Knight, who is apparently located in a black vault above the city, and who made the ultimate sacrifice to save Hollow Nest. Next to them are three beings who look eerily similar to the three beings we see after we defeat Hornet. Their masks also look like the masks on the black egg we saw earlier, which confirms that not only are these beings the key, but that the Hollow Knight is inside that temple. At the moment, the player has no idea what any of this means, but to spoil it ahead of time, the Pale King and the White Lady use the Hollow Knight as a vessel to seal the infection. Originally, the Pale King likely figured his five great knights could handle it, but it seems like they too have succumbed to its effects. The five great knights of Hollow Nest were named Hegemold, Drya, Zamir, Isma, and Ogrim. Drya and Isma are both dead due to various circumstances, Drya because she was defending the White Lady from the Mantis traitors who sought to kill her, and Isma is attached to the wall via these plants, but it's unclear if that's what killed her or not. Zamir and Ogrim are the only two that are confirmed to be alive as they're the Grey Mourner and Dung Defender respectively. Zamir seems to be extremely depressed over the loss of her lover who is, oddly enough, the Traitor Lord's child, and Ogrim seems to have gone manic due to his fascination with Dung, although it's possible he was always like this. Hegemold is the oddest of the five though, as his status is up in the air, as his armor was taken by a maggot when he was sleeping, who we know is the False Knight. It's unclear whether this being killed Hegemold while he slept or just took his armor, but at the moment Hegemold is possibly defenseless and wandering around the Hollow Nest looking for his armor. Either way, not even the Great Knights of Hollow Nest could defeat this being, as Ogrim himself says that it's hard to kill something that has no form, so the Pale King had to take drastic measures by using the Hollow Knight as a vessel. He would then take this being inside the Black Egg Temple and then use these three people called Dreamers as locks in order to prevent it from opening. Our main objective is eventually going to be to find these Dreamers and then defeat them so we can get inside the egg, but we don't even know where to start yet. Thankfully, there is a shrine that can give us the locations. Unfortunately, we also get sent into the Dream Realm by the Dreamers themselves. Just like its name implies, this is a realm conjured up by dreams. This is due to the being who's helping us escape called Seer. They are the last member of the Moth tribe who were able to manipulate dreams. They, like some of the other tribes, used to worship their own higher being called the Radiance, as according to them they were born of its light. Over time though, the tribe had forsaken its god in favor of the Pale King once he arrived. The king then gave them the job of watching over the dead due to their affinity with the Dream Realm. That's how Seer was able to help us escape and why they're located here in the resting grounds which is a place within Hollow Nest where the dead would be buried and loved ones would come to perform rituals and say prayers. Seer feels guilty for this though and wants to atone for their ancestors' mistakes of not worshipping their true creator by helping us out. That may sound a bit odd given that we have no connection to the Radiance, but you'd be surprised how connected the Knight and their god are. You might even say it's the only reason the Knight exists. I'll get to all that later, as for now Seer gives us a dream nail, which allows us to peer into the minds of those in Hollow Nest and read their thoughts. This serves as both a story and gameplay device, as gameplay-wise it'll allow us to not only challenge new bosses called the Warrior Dreams, but also let us fight stronger versions of older bosses, like the False Knight who is now called the Failed Champion. It's not every boss in the game, but it gives the player more content to mess around with. As for the Warrior Dreams, these are all important people within Hollow Nest history, and while none of them really add anything to the main story, they're a nice way of adding world building to the game. For example, Elder Hu was a monk who came to the Mantis village in order to cure those afflicted by the infection, but ended up being killed by the Mantis tribe as he had unknowingly been affected himself. 
There's also Noise, who ripped her and her people's eyes out in an attempt to stop the visions and nightmares they were having thanks to the infection. Now, not every warrior dream is as compelling as these, as Galeon, for example, just wanted to prove his worth to the Pale King as he was one of the strongest knights around, so he ventured into the deepness looking for battle only to die shortly after arriving. But still, they were not only fun fights, but they added to the world building and exploration of Hollow Knight by giving the player even more things to uncover in this vast kingdom. Circling back to the Dream Nail though, while those aforementioned details are more centered around the gameplay, story-wise it allows us to peer into the minds of NPCs and bosses, adding yet another item to our arsenal of story tools, as next to the lore tablets, NPC dialogue, and the Hunter's Journal now sits the Dream Nail. I will say, while this game can be a bit overwhelming at times when it comes to how much content there is to uncover and how much reading is needed to actually lay out a proper timeline of events, it's not only worth the effort, but the variety of tools we have allows for more creative options. Instead of having an NPC info dump information to us, the team can instead turn it into Dream Nail dialogue. This gives us more pieces to the puzzle, in addition to making us question why they didn't say that to us. Such as the Mask Maker who wonders if the Knight knows about the face that hides beneath theirs. Why didn't he say that to the Knight? Is the Mask Maker hiding something, or does he want them to find out for themselves? It's honestly a really genius mechanic thanks to adding even more depth to the story than there admittedly already was. Returning back to the story, thanks to Seer giving us the Dream Nail, we can now use this on the other beings we call the Dreamers in order to defeat them. At the moment, we don't know that the Dream Nail will be used in this way, as the game never tells us, but it's something you'll find out very quickly, as none of the Dreamers are actually alive. The three Dreamers are named Monomon, Lurian, and Hera, and each one is located in a different part of Hollow Nest and has their own stories for us to uncover. However, due to the freedom and flexibility of Hollow Knight's gameplay, you could challenge them in any order you wish, so we'll just go in the order that I took them on, which means Monomon is up first. Within the Fog Canyon is a large building called the Teacher's Archives. Just outside its door is a being named Quarrel. This is an NPC you'll likely meet throughout your journey who, like the Knight, has come here for an unknown reason. Most of his talks are about the areas in which you find him in, like questioning where the rain comes from in the City of Tears, or mentioning how it's sad to see that the miners of the Crystal Peak are still mining away at the walls despite being overcome by the infection. Within these talks though, mainly thanks to the Dream Nail, we can tell that Quarrel has been tasked with something and has come here for a reason, and after enough exploring, his quest has led him here. He claims that this building feels familiar to him, in fact quite a few things about the Hollow Nest feel familiar to him, as he seems to remember the Nailsmith but can't figure out why, and then goes on to talk about the crystals within the peak, which is then followed up by him saying, Such strange ancient facts. I wonder where my knowledge comes from. The reason he's having these thoughts is because he's lived here before. Furthermore, he knows Monomon all too well as he's her apprentice. Monomon seems to be a teacher and researcher within Hollow Nest as her quarters are filled with test tubes and lab notes. It's unclear why her lab is here of all places, but it is quite a ways away from the other tribes, and it's also possible that the jellyfish here are what she was studying at the time before becoming a dreamer. She was also likely chosen for this role due to her immense knowledge of the Hollow Nest. Seeing as she's quite the intellect, it's no wonder she had put in place numerous failsafes to make sure her plan succeeded, as defending her is Umu, a giant sentient jellyfish whose whole purpose is to defend the Archive, with her other protector being Quirrell himself, as the mask he wears as a hat has the same design as hers. She seems to have called Quirrell back to the Hollow Nest in order to set her free, as Quirrell not only lets us defeat her but also helps us fight Umu, so clearly we have the same goal. This also means that setting them free seems to be the right plan, at least at the moment. The Dreamers were obviously tasked with sealing the Hollow Knight, but killing them would, in theory, set it free. But Monomon seems to think this is the right idea, and her Dream Nail dialogue corroborates this, as she wants the seals of the temple to break. So we end up following along and going into the Dream Realm to defeat Monomon. Thankfully, it's not another boss fight, as all that's required of us is to hit her and then absorb her essence into us. Returning to the real world sees Quirrell sitting by the tank that used to house his teacher. He's saddened by her passing, but knows that that's what she wanted. He'll then disappear from the archives never to be seen again, unless you manage to find your way to the Blue Lake, in which you'll find him sitting alone by the shore. Earlier in your journey, Quirrell mentioned how he wanted to see where the rain came from in the City of Tears, and he seems to have found it. You can join Quirrell and relax here for as long as you want, but leaving and returning will see him disappear once again with the sword stuck in the ground, implying that he's completed his journey and moved on. Where he plans to go next is unclear and will likely never be known, but similar to my thoughts on Cornover, it was always nice to catch up with Quirrell every now and then and be able to listen to his thoughts on the Hollow Nest. He's a very likable character, easily one of my favorites in the game, and being able to fight together even if it was only once was a great way to end his questline. After Monomon is Lurian the Watcher. They're located at the top of the City of Tears in a building they call the Watcher's Spire. Given the location of their room, it seems like Lurian was someone within Hollow Nest High Society, possibly one of the more popular ones given that they have a tower all to themselves. Unlike Monomon, Lurian didn't seem to have some kind of grand plan as they just decided to do this out of the kindness of their heart as he cared about Hollow Nest and its city. 
Blocking us from reaching him though are the Watcher Knights, a large army of knights who were tasked with guarding Lurian with their lives. Oddly enough, all of them are dead by the time we arrive, so it seems like they never left the room and then slowly died over time, meaning they just left his quarters wide open for us to get to. However, I guess they did succeed in defending Lurian until their dying breath, so mission accomplished, I guess. Sadly, it's not going to be as simple as that though, as something comes from the ceiling and reanimates the knights to fight again. Judging from its orange color scheme, it seems to be connected to the infection, but it's never explained. After their defeat, we could finally meet with Lurian, and just like Monomon, go into the Dream Room and absorb their essence. I know that was a bit fast, and I was surprised too, as the other Dreamers had at least something tying them back to the world, but Lurian really just seems to be a person of the city who wanted to do some good. Our final Dreamer is Hera the Beast. She's located deep in the Deep Nest, as she at the time was the leader of her people. As we know, the Deep Nest belongs to the Weavers and the Spider Tribe. But we also know that most of the kingdom didn't like them, and the Mantises under the Order of the Pale King were tasked with keeping them away from the rest of the kingdom. This just shows how desperate the king was to stop the infection, as he went to the one tribe that hated him the most in order to work something out. After lots of negotiating, Hera eventually agreed to become a dreamer, but only if the Pale King agreed to have a child with her. And from numerous pieces of dialogue, and thanks to her literally appearing shortly after killing Hera, we learn that this child was Hornet. It's never explicitly stated why Hera wanted a child, but given that her partner died at some point prior, it's possible that she just wanted one. It's quite unfortunate though that she didn't get much time, if any, to spend with Hornet, given that Hera was then sent into the dream shortly after, but like Lurian, she wanted to make sure the world was a better place, not just for her people, but for her eventual child. This, funny enough, also means that Hornet is old as shit, as while we don't know how long it's been since the Hollow Knight was sealed, we can assume it was a very long time ago. Also, speaking of funny ages, the other bug, despite being called that, is probably one of the youngest bugs in the game. As he remarks how he's never seen the stag stations before, as they were closed before he arrived, but they closed once the infection started spreading. So he's actually quite young in comparison to the others of the Hollow Nest, and even younger than the Knight given their origin. To get to Hera though, we have to do a bit more work than before. At the core of the Deep Nest is a giant open room filled with spiderwebs. One of the rooms has numerous corpses being strung up or tied together, which connects to the room right next door as these villagers encourage us to sit down, only to tie us up once we do. I don't recall the game ever mentioning anything about these beings outside of this one interaction, but it's possible that they're the spiders of the Deep Nest using a disguise. Within the Deep Nest, the player may come across another knight wandering around. If you manage to follow them all the way through their nest, you'll be trapped and attacked by Nosk, who has disguised itself as the knight in order to lure us into their lair. It's possible that these villagers are also just disguises used to lure other bugs into the Deep Nest, which explains why we find so many carcasses in the other room. Additionally, we could find the bodies of the villagers after we escape their trap, and they're laid out in a manner that implies that it's a costume or cloak of some kind instead of an actual body. Now that we're trapped though, we need to break free, and by doing so and reaching the end of this maze, we can find the body of Hera. Just like before, all we have to do is go into the dream and absorb her essence. But now that all the dreamers are dead, the temple is open and we can go inside. But upon arrival, you'll notice that something's changed. The crossroads has become infected, and new enemies along with infected versions of old ones now pollute the streets. This event occurs after the death of one dreamer or if we acquire the Monarch Wings, which have us fighting a boss called the Broken Vessel in order to reach it. This seems to be another being similar to the Knight that was killed but is now being puppeteered by the infection. This is all basically an attempt to make an early game area much harder as by now most of the enemies die on one or two hits, but it's also a good way of showing how easy it is for the infection to spread as well as how close the infection is to breaking out of the Hollow Knight. While this is definitely a cause for concern and should be something we do right away, we aren't going to do that and instead, attend the circus. After the release of Hollow Knight, four DLCs were released for the game. Two of them were more gameplay focused, called Hidden Dreams and Lifeblood, with the other two being more story focused, named The Grim Troop and Godmaster. The Grim Troop first starts in the Howling Cliffs and is activated by striking this brazier hidden in a secret room. This calls a few new people to Dirtmouth who make the Elder Bug uncomfortable. Anyone who scares the Elder Bug is immediately on my hit list, so let's go see what these clowns have to say for themselves. Well, apparently Clown wasn't far off, as the Grim Troop are a traveling band of circus performers, except they only seem to perform for their own people and only have one act, which is centered around the main head of the troop, Grim. He has one of the best opening acts I've ever seen, in which he gives us custody of his child, tells us to raise it, and then disappears. I guess you could call me the new stepfather, but I'm really just the father who stepped up. Nevertheless, to raise this child, they must equip the new charm, Grim Child, and then take it to various points throughout Hollow Nest or to capture the flames located there. These will always have some kind of enemy that we have to defeat, so there's at least some level of challenge here. The issue is that this is all we do for most of the DLC. 
We grab three flames from Hollow Nest, go back to Grim, get three more, return to him, fight Grim, grab three more, and then choose our ending. It's not exactly the most stimulating experience out there, but I do recognize that this would have been better suited to do throughout the playthrough. Usually for my videos, I record the DLCs after the main content is done so as to organize my recordings. In fact, at this point in the playthrough, I had already done the three main endings of the game, so this was all I had left to do. This decision ended up making the DLC a chore to go through as it's the same nonsense over and over again, which is why I think doing this along with the other content would create a much better experience. It's best to treat the Grim Tube not as a DLC, but just as another mystery within Hollow Nest to uncover as you go, as it will feel a lot better than spending 20 minutes going back and forth picking up all the flames. Regarding those flames, what these are are basically the flames of a kingdom. The Grim Troop seems to go to the kingdoms that have long since passed and collect these eternal scarlet flames. They then use these flames in the ritual, which is what Grim is having us do for him. It feels a little odd to kill Grim's own people to gather these, as I feel like a simple conversation could avoid any unnecessary bloodshed, but given how this DLC ends, it's fair to assume that Grim is doing this to make sure the child is ready and prepared, as giving it the tools it needs to grow without struggle would hinder its growth. This is also another reason why I think doing this DLC along with the rest of the content is a much better option, as you actually get time to use the Grim Child and experiment with their different forms, unlike me, where I had it for maybe 30 minutes at most. Once we come back a second time, Grim will thank us for helping and have us take part in an upcoming act he's performing, which means we have a boss to fight. Grim has no plans on dying here, just like Hornet, as he's just gauging our strength and making sure the child is worthy. Kind of a shame we can't actually use the child in the fight though, as it's required to start the duel with Grimm, but then he just takes the child back, meaning we're also wasting a couple notches in the process. Overall, Grimm himself wasn't too difficult, and I found him to be very mechanically engaging like most of the bosses, but I was a much bigger fan of his other version. After gathering the last set of flames, we come across Brum, another member of the troop, who tells us that if we want to send the Grimm troop away, we can stop the ritual. This leads to two endings, one where we stop the troop, and another where we continue the ritual. Judging from the ritual ending, it seems like all the members of the troop serve a higher being located in the dream realm. It doesn't seem like the troop is allied with the being though, as they seem to be partaking in the ritual against their own will, as evidenced by Brum asking if we want to stop the thing they literally came here to do. The ritual itself seems to be how the higher being sustains itself and continues its life cycle, but most of the details behind it are unclear. In fact, quite a lot of this DLC is actually unclear, which is probably my biggest issue with it, as it feels like it ends too quickly. I came out of this DLC not with satisfaction, but more confusion, as I was still trying to figure out what was even going on here. The Banishment ending sees us just stopping the ritual by striking the brazier again, which is an odd way to end things given we just killed or stopped a god by hitting a pot, but okay. Which is then followed up by the troop disappearing and an NPC named Nim seeking refuge here in Dirtmouth. This is very clearly Brum from before, but without their previous memories, as they claim to not know where they are or how they got here. The ritual ending has us challenge Nightmare King Grimm, a stronger version of the original Grimm, who upon death seems to disappear along with the troop. Judging by the design of the Grimm Child and the various sources of info, it seems like the Grimm Child took the essence of Grimm and will eventually become the new Grimm, only to be eaten by the next Grimm Child, repeating the cycle. It's a cliffhanger type ending, but not one that feels satisfying in any way. To be fair, cliffhangers aren't meant to be satisfying, but it goes back to what I said earlier. It felt like we were just getting into the meat of this thing, only for it to end right when it was getting good. There is no fight against this higher being, no section where we talk to it or even really do anything, which is a shame. That being said, the one thing that does at least warrant some discussion is one of Grimm's Dreamnail dialogues, which talks about the Pale King and the Knight. More specifically referring to the Knight as a vessel, which is something that will make more sense when we talk about the ending shortly. But it seems to imply that Grimm knows of the other higher beings, likely because of his relationship with his higher being. Regardless, I think the good ending in this context would have to be the banishment ending as it's very clear that the troop is being used by the higher being to extend its life. So by stopping that, we prevent the troop from being manipulated and the higher being who started this either has to find the new kingdom to pillage or will die thanks to us stopping it. That being said though, I'm not a huge fan of the banishment ending because doing so means you'll miss probably the best fight in the whole game. Nightmare King Grimm is my favorite boss in Hollow Knight due to how intense the fight was. He's one of those bosses that doesn't have a lot of stuff surrounding him, meaning all you have to do is learn his moves and then counterattack every time until he's dead. This became a bit of an issue though, as Nightmare King Grimm is not only faster and harder to kill, but his moves change as well. One of his most common moves is this bat attack. In the original fight, all you have to do is double jump over the three, allowing you to dodge all the bats and get him one or two hits in before he disappears. With the Nightmare version though, he not only sends four bats at you, but they're positioned in a way that will punish you for double jumping. Instead, what you're meant to do is jump once right when the first bat passes over you, then dodge forward, allowing you to reach Grimm without taking damage. This became a bit of a problem for me, as I had to not only unlearn my old habits from fighting original Grimm, but also learn new habits involved with Nightmare Grimm. 
To make matters worse, he is, I believe, one of two bosses in the game to do at minimum two masks of damage instead of one. The game also lets you know things are getting real serious now because if instead of his name appearing in the bottom corner like all the other bosses, his name takes up the whole screen. Once you defeat Grimm though, he then ends up disappearing along with the rest of the troop thanks to them completing the ritual. Like I said, it's a bit of a quick ending as I felt like things were about to get good, but then it ends. Overall though, I enjoyed the DLC as a short little side story that occurs alongside the knight's journey. I do wish more was mentioned regarding the troop as it's unclear what we even did in either ending, and given that it's a DLC, I have my doubts that this will ever be mentioned in a sequel. And assuming that's true, it ends up making the Grim Troop out to be a faction and DLC that kind of leaves you scratching your head wondering what you even did. With the circus out of business, we can now return to the task at hand and take the fight to the Hollow Knight. Upon stepping into the Black Egg, we're then greeted to an extremely dark room only being lit up thanks to the pillars that appear as we walk. After walking through the large hallway, we enter the room that houses the Hollow Knight. Upon breaking his binds, he immediately attacks us. Seeing as the infection is slowly taking over the room along with him, it's clear he isn't in control of his actions. But there does still seem to be some amount of him left, as he'll stab himself throughout the fight. It's kind of horrifying in a way, actually, watching this being battle his own mind while simultaneously killing you and himself. Just goes to show how deadly this infection is and how much pain the Hollow Knight is in because of it. Assuming you can get through all of his phases, you strike the Hollow Knight one last time, which has him crying out in pain as the Knight, like the Dreamers, consumes his essence. The Knight will then take up the mantle as Vessel and replace the Hollow Knight containing the infection within its body, thus saving the Hollow Nest, but also repeating the cycle of torment as it's only a matter of time until it breaks free again. It's a pretty sad ending, and not exactly satisfying, for many reasons. One of which being that the game told me that I didn't achieve 100% completion, so I knew that there was still more to go. But more importantly, Hornet never showed up. Despite being quite the pivotal character it seems, she didn't make another appearance after defeating Hera, meaning we still have more to do. Hollow Knight's endings tie back into that exploration side of the story. The more you explore, the more you learn. And by getting this ending, it shows that we didn't learn anything. We may have learned about Hollow Nest, but we haven't learned about us and our role in all this, so we need to keep looking. Fortunately, there are two more endings for us to find. What prompts the activation of the second ending is the acquisition of an item called the Void Heart, which is an item called the King Soul that is tainted by the power of the Void. But the King Soul is split into two and needs to be mended together by acquiring both pieces that are kept by our two rulers, the White Lady and the Pale King. The Queen is located in the Queen's Garden, who thankfully gives us the first half upon talking to her. As I mentioned earlier, she liked to come here as a sort of home away from home. But the traitors in Moskin didn't take too kindly to, as they say, a pale one intruding on their land, so they attempted to kill her. Drya, one of the five knights, was able to hold off all those that would inflict harm upon her, but it came at the cost of her own life. The White Lady is hard to talk about though, as she doesn't really display any sort of magical powers. She is most definitely a higher being like the Pale King, but we don't really know what she can do. One thing we do know is that these bindings that are wrapped around her were of her own volition. According to her, she has this insatiable urge to spread her seed and breed but she regrets her recent endeavors and as such bound herself together. These bindings may also be weakening her in some way, as her strength is not what it used to be, as she has trouble seeing right in front of her. This specific regret though is tied to the Pale King who we'll meet very shortly. To get to him and to understand his role in all this, we need the King's Brain and the Awoken Dream Nail. This more powerful version of the Dream Nail is only accessible after giving Seer 1800 Essence. You can collect Essence in this game by either fighting the Warrior Dreams, fighting the repeat Dream Bosses like Dung Defender or Zote, and collecting these orbs and these dream roots. Neither of these though will provide you with enough essence on its own, so it's recommended that you dabble in each in order to acquire the necessary amount. This awakened version allows us to go into the ancient basin and dream nail this dead Kingsguard. This takes us to the White Palace, the home of the Pale King. Originally this palace used to exist in the physical world, right where we just were. But once the infection hit, the king gathered his top subjects and teleported into the dream realm away from all the chaos of the Hollow Nest. The White Palace, as the name suggests, is extremely white and covered in shiny ordained pillars and towers. It's also got a few people from Hollow Nest in here who only talk about the king and their want to serve him. To get to the king, we need to go through an obstacle course of traps that are filled with spikes and saw blades. Which makes me wonder why the king even has guards in the first place, as this is more than enough to stop anyone from finding him. Except, of course, us, as we're the knight and we can do anything. Upon arriving to the king's quarters though, we can see that he's been dead for quite a while. The contrast of the room is very well done, as everything so far has been bright and holy, but the actual bedchambers of the king himself are the darkest part of the palace. Thanks to him being dead though, we can't get anything out of him except one Dream Nail dialogue that says no cost too great, which connects to where we go next. At the bottom of the King's Edge is where we find our next item, the King Brand, but stopping us is Hornet, who is once again here to test our strength and see if we're worthy of continuing. She warns us that continuing further will only bring about dark truth, and it's one that weak-minded individuals cannot bear to learn. I do want to clarify, Hornet seems to have no qualms of killing us, as she doesn't want to ally herself with a weakling, so it's not like Grim where they have a plan that involves us, Hornet will gladly carry on without us and do things her way. 
That being said, I do believe dying is canon in these games, as we leave behind a shade that we can kill in order to get our stuff back, and Confessor GG is based around this mechanic as they can summon our shade for us. So it does seem like dying is a part of our journey, although I'm still unsure of that fact myself. Regardless, once you defeat Hornet, she will finally realize that we're strong enough to continue and that teaming up would prove beneficial to her. That's because Hornet will save us once we enter what's behind her. This shell is actually the remnants of the Pale King when he first arrived in what would become Hollow Nest. The Pale King is considered a worm, and death to them is not as simple as dying, but more so shedding their skin and becoming a different version of their original self. The Pale King was presumably as large as this shell implies, but thanks to him shedding his skin, he's now a lot smaller. The reason we're here though is that the King's Brand is inside its shell and is going to be used to unlock a specific door in the Ancient Basin. Upon picking it up though, the shell starts to crumble and collapses on the night before Horna comes by to drag them out, further confirming that she now sees us as a worthy ally. With the King's Brand in hand, we can now go to the giant door locked in the Ancient Basin that locked away the Abyss. The Abyss is a very dark location filled with sharp spikes, a black void, and hundreds of masks and shades similar to that of our knight. Within here is also a large creature holding a bowl filled with black liquid. I'm still not entirely sure what's up with this specific individual, but there are quite a few creatures like this throughout the game, like these statues. Gameplay-wise, they give us soul that we can use for spells and for health, but they seem to point to an ancient civilization that existed long before the Pale King's arrival. A civilization that may have worshipped the void that permeates this location. But while the King's Brand allowed us access to the whole area, a specific location inside the Abyss is only accessible thanks to the King's Soul. This leads us to a giant black egg that upon hitting it takes us into a flashback. We see the knight at the bottom of the abyss, attempting to climb back up to the door that we entered through, while text continues to flash on screen saying things like no mind to think or no will to break. This ends once we reach the top in which we see the pale king and another knight leaving the abyss before closing the door forever. What this tells us is that the knight was born here in the abyss and is made of the void, and that these other people we've come across are our siblings. Furthermore, the shape of the sibling's head is eerily similar to the hollow knight's, meaning he too is our brother. So with the biggest twist of the story now revealed, it's finally time to talk about what's going on here. Years ago, the Pale King came to this land to die, until it shed its skin and took on its new form. He then decided to give his power to his people, causing them to see him as a god. After some time, the Kingdom of Hollow Nest was born, but soon after came the infection. It swept across the land, taking over people's minds and seeping into their dreams. The King, along with his queen, the White Lady, attempted to stop this threat by creating the vessels. The vessels are the knight and their siblings. Their whole purpose was to be, for a lack of a better word, a box that seals the infection away. The dialogue that talked about no mind to think and no will to break was referencing the vessels. That's why the knight can't talk or feel emotion, as these are things that the infection could manipulate. The king and the white lady made hundreds if not thousands of these beings in order to find the perfect vessel. Eventually, the pale king determined that the hollow knight was the one, so he came to the abyss, took him from his siblings, and locked away all the trash. Now the game never explains why the Hollow Knight specifically was the chosen one, but I wonder if it has to do with the Abyss itself, as this place is a pain in the ass to get out of and that's with the tools we found, like double jumping, dashes, and wall climb, things the vessels don't have. So it's my theory that the Pale King chose the Hollow Knight because he was the first one to escape the Abyss. This could also explain the hundreds of bodies on the floor, as the vessels could have possibly been climbing on top of each other in order to escape. Another thing that's also not explained is the door itself, as the Pale King clearly locked the vessels away, yet some of them, including us, managed to escape. I sadly don't have any theories this time, as this door is the only way out and required the King's Brain to open, so your guess is as good as mine. As an extra layer of safety, though, the Pale King put the Hollow Knight in the Black Egg Temple and sealed it using Lurian, Hera, and Monomon, who later became known as the Dreamers. Now that we know our true origin, the first thing we need to consider is our relationship with the Hornet and Zote. As I mentioned earlier, both are similar to the knight design-wise, with Zope being the more obvious of the two. Since Hornet was conceived by the Pale King and Hera, that makes Hornet our step-sibling. She isn't a vessel like we are, but she is related to us through the Pale King. As for Zote, I don't think he's a vessel for the simple fact that he could speak and think. Whether or not he intentionally created an outfit to look like the other siblings and the knight is unclear and also very Zote, but I don't think Zote is meant to be a vessel. Circling back to the Hollow Knight though, we have to ask the obvious question, what the hell happened? He was supposed to be the perfect vessel, so how did it fail? Well, it was actually the Pale King's own doing. Inside the White Palace is one of the most annoying platforming puzzles in the whole game called the Path of Pain. But if you can somehow cross it without wanting to tear your hair out, you'll be shown another flashback of the Hollow Knight and the Pale King resting in the White Palace. The Pale King thought of the Hollow Knight as his own son, which is technically true, but this caused the Hollow Knight to gain emotions and feelings, something it wasn't supposed to have, which is why the infection started spreading. That's also why the first ending is still considered sad and ultimately pointless, as we too have gained emotions and feelings thanks to us interacting with the NPCs. All this circles back to the introduction of the game though. The knight was summoned here by the call of the Hollow Knight to fulfill its purpose, seal the infection, and protect Hollow Nest. But is that the only way? Well, 
Let's find out. Returning back to the temple, we find Hornet who tells us that she'll aid us in our fight against the Hollow Knight but can only stay for a short time as the void within the egg would kill her, further proving that she was not made to be a vessel. The boss fight continues as normal until the final phase, which sees Hornet tying down the Hollow Knight and giving us an opening. Its head is also surrounded by Dream Essence, but if you somehow miss this clue, Hornet will pass out and the fight continues. Defeating the Hollow Knight now sees Hornet locked inside the egg with her mask being put on the outside of the temple, implying that she's now a dreamer, while the knight once again becomes the new vessel for the infection. Once again, not an amazing ending and definitely not the final one as we still have one more thing to do. If we instead dream know the Hollow Knight, we go into its mind to find the source of the infection. Inside the Hollow Knight was the Radiance, a higher being and also the creator of the infection that has infested Hollow Nest. To add to our previous talk, when the Pale King arrived and became a god, we know that Seer's ancestors, the Moth Tribe, forsook the Radiance in favor of the Pale King. Well, the Radiance, in an attention-seeking attempt to seek attention, decided to use her powers as a way to influence the bugs of Hollow Nest. Those dreams and visions all of the citizens were seeing was because the Radiance wanted itself to be known. Many of its residents resisted these thoughts, and this resistance resulted in the manifestation of the infection. It seems like the Radiance believed that if the people wouldn't accept and worship her willingly, then she would do it by force. The Pale King, after hearing word of this infection, attempted to stop it, and, well, we know the rest. But now, as the Knight, we're tasked with stopping the infection at the source and putting this thing to rest once and for all. One thing I'm a real sucker for that Hollow Knight uses quite a bit is making the story or fights based around concepts and ideas. The Pale King blessed the bugs of his land with the ability to think, but the Radiance wants to regress its inhabitants back to their original, more primitive states, as they would be easier to control. As you can see, their goals for the people of Hollow Nest are polar opposites. The Radiance is also a warrior that wields light, while the Knight wields the powers of the Void, two substances that would be at odds with one another. In fact, you might even say that they are the embodiments of these concepts, as the Radiance is the brightest being in existence, as far as we know, and is presumably responsible for the creation of Essence, while the Knight is a being born of Void, who also thinks the Void Heart item we got earlier just reunited the Void under him, which is why the Void slowly starts to creep into the boss fight. Like I said, I'm a real sucker for this stuff as it makes it more than just a boss fight to me, as the forces of dark and light are literally coming together to do battle with one another. Unfortunately though, the Radiance is too strong for the Knight on their own. However, she is unaware of the siblings waiting down below that are waiting for their time to strike. The Knight evolves its original shade form and becomes something else entirely, using its new void-like powers to strike the Radiance while the shade of the Hollow Knight holds it down. And with that, the Radiance is defeated, Hollow Nest is saved, the Infection is no more, Hornet is alive, and the siblings including the Knight have served their purpose and can now finally rest. Talk about an ending. It's beautiful, and the music really tugs on the heartstrings a bit as we can finally say that after all the deaths and failures, we did it. We won. It's such a wonderful ending and is my favorite in the game, from the quest it took to get here, to the boss fight itself, to the final rush to the end while the siblings all wait in anticipation, ready to back us up. It's a fantastic ending and a wonderful end to Hollow Knight's story. Except, it wouldn't be, as one more DLC would release that ends up sort of soiling this otherwise great ending. A year and a half after release, Team Cherry, the people behind the game, would release the final piece of content for Hollow Knight titled Godmaster which not only added a wealth of new content, but also two new endings. 
The best way to describe Godmaster is to say that it's a tale of two extremes. It took what made Hollow Knight's gameplay so much fun and put it together in a neatly wrapped package, yet despite recognizing what made Hollow Knight's gameplay so fun to play, it clearly didn't recognize what made its original story so fun to learn, as it applies none of those same methods of storytelling here in the DLC. It first starts in the junk pit underneath the City of Tears. In here is a new NPC called the God Seeker, who upon dream nailing will send us to its home aptly named the God Home. From here the player is left to their own devices, and you can immediately tell that this is a boss rush DLC through and through. There are initially three pantheons, which after being completed will unlock a fourth, which upon its completion will unlock the fifth and final pantheon for the player to participate in. Each one has a set number of bosses from the main game that get increasingly more difficult, with the first pantheon having bosses like the Vengefly King and Hornet, to the fourth one containing the likes of numerous warrior dreams and dream bosses. Each of them have ten bosses each, with the fifth one being the ultimate test as it's the previous four put together, in addition to adding newer bosses like Nightmare King Grimm and changes to previous boss fights like the Vengefly King who is now joined by a second one in this specific version. To add insult to injury, all of them must be done without dying. While the game does have benches, usually halfway through the Pantheon, that allow you to regain your health and soul back as well as respec your charms, they aren't save points like in the main game. If you're up for even more challenge, you can also add bindings to the doors, such as less damage or no spells. Due to this level of difficulty though, you're likely going to struggle. Fortunately, the game has another room called the Hall of Gods, which lets you challenge every boss in the game. Each of them also has three difficulties, which you can track using a board at the front door. Attuned is the basic default difficulty, Ascended is a slightly harder version of the original difficulty, and Radiant is the previous difficulty along with the ever so small caveat that you die in one hit. It is as difficult as it sounds, but it would be an understatement to say that there is a lot of content here. You could be here for over 10 to 20 hours just going through everything, and clearly Team Cherry knew that the community would want to play this more because they made a game mode specifically for this DLC. After unlocking the 4th Pantheon, you also gain access to the God Seeker mode, which gives you all the charms, nail upgrades, spells, and masks, but you can't leave the God Home. It's supposed to be for those that want to play the DLC's content, but don't want to go through a whole 30 plus hour playthrough just to get prepared for it. Like I said, it takes everything that makes Hollow Knight's gameplay so good and puts it all together in one DLC, and I had a blast going through the Pantheons and practicing on the bosses that I struggle with, but its story is what really dragged down the experience here. It's hard to really call it a story, as similar to the previous DLC, you don't even know what you're doing here, and you're given even less answers as to what's going on. The God Seeker is a large being that presumably locked itself inside of a coffin so that it wouldn't be disturbed. That's because the God Seeker's people all live inside the God Home Dream Realm. They basically put all their people's minds into one being, and it's thanks to this that they're able to conjure up the Dream Realm with ease. At the beginning though, the God Seeker is incoherent and will stay this way until we go through the Pantheons. That's because the God Seeker wants to attune to the gods of the Hollow Nest which in layman's terms are the bosses we fight in the pantheons. You can think of each boss as a rung on a ladder, and we're slowly climbing higher and higher until we reach the top. That's why the bosses slowly get harder across the pantheons, as the Godseeker needs more strength than the last to ascend higher. So to help the Godseeker ascend, we have to do all the pantheons. And I do mean, all of them. Yeah, the ending of this DLC is locked behind the 42 boss rush pantheon. Hollow Knight is definitely a difficult game, there is no doubt about that, but I'd argue this is too difficult, only because the story content is locked behind something that's mostly designed for gameplay purposes. But even if we're to ignore the difficulty, why is the story tied to this? Admittedly, I don't play many games with boss rush modes, and even the ones that do, I'm not too interested in doing so. So maybe this is a common thing, but I've never seen a game tied story to something like this before, and that's probably because it doesn't make sense to. The Godseeker only appears during the Pantheons, meaning you have to go through all of them just to speak with them, and even then their dialogue is as tedious as the Pantheons themselves. Your first meeting with them is in the second last room of the first Pantheon, and it goes about as you would expect. The Godseeker scolds you for being in their domain and tells you to leave immediately, lest we want divine punishment to be struck down upon us. This same dialogue is basically repeated throughout the other Pantheons as well. There are three places where the Godseeker can talk to us, which are before the Pantheon starts, the second to last room of the Pantheon, and then out by the junk pit, but they only have new dialogue when you complete one. So in order of events, you'll listen to them in the beginning, battle through the bosses, listen to them towards the end, beat it, and then talk to them at the junk pit. You'll be repeating this four times for the four pantheons, yet at no point does the dialogue ever change. It's the same thing, just in a different font. It's all about us and how we are ruining their plans and how the gods of the Holoness should kill us as a result. We are 80% of the way through this story and all we've gained is a hater. What immediately confused me though, were these talks, because the Godseeker makes it explicitly clear that they attune to the minds of the bosses through ritual combat, but isn't that what we're doing? If anything, aren't we helping them? We don't see the Godseekers fighting, nor do we see the bosses fight each other, so it seems like they're just lounging around doing nothing until we showed up. 
I will say though, it seems like the bosses are conscious enough to recognize where they are, as Grimm bows to the Godseeker and Hornet's dream nail dialogue talks about whether she's in her dream or in ours, but seeing as Hornet never talks about this outside of the DLC and no other characters mention something like this, it's kind of pointless to talk about. Either way, the reason we're doing this is because the Godseekers have an obsession with gods. They used to be from a place called the Land of Storms, but after their gods abandoned them, they left to go find something else to serve. This is when they decided to merge into one being as it was easier for them to travel, and their combined knowledge managed to create the god home they all inhabit. The reason they came here is because the mask they wear is used to find the essence of great warriors and Hollow Nest is supposedly filled with them, so they're hoping to use this in order to ascend. The God Seekers are basically trying to be Hollow Nest's biggest dick riders, as communing with what they call the God of Gods located here will allow them to ascend to their highest potential. What this God of Gods is at the moment is unknown, but once you arrive to the fourth pantheon, the God Seeker will talk about the boss in the next room being the last one they need to attune to in order to find their God of Gods. And seeing as this boss is the pure vessel, a perfected version of the Hollow Knight, this God of Gods is likely the Radiance. This is then pretty much confirmed in the final Pantheon, as the Radiance is now called the Absolute Radiance, who is the final boss of the Pantheon, but can only be fought in that final fifth Pantheon. As you can see, the storytelling, if we can call it that, is almost non-existent, as we're forced to play through these incredibly tedious rooms just to get the same dialogue set in different words. It's only until the fifth Pantheon where things seem to start to go somewhere, but ultimately that doesn't end well either. Instead of showing up once, the Godseeker finally gets their act together and shows up a few more times now, while also showing us visions of various higher beings within Hollow Nest, mainly Un, the White Lady, and the Pale King, but their dialogue is once again pointless. All the Godseeker does is comment on the beings themselves and sometimes ask itself questions, which oddly enough we know the answers to. The Godseeker talks about Un and says that they can feel their strength waning and that they must have been pretty strong back in the day. They also comment on the White Lady's lack of strength and ask why she is hiding from them, likely referencing her lack of power and how their mask can't detect her, which we know is thanks to the binding she put on herself. In regards to the Pale King, they mention once again how they can feel its power emanating from its body, but wonder why he took on the form he did, as the Godseeker claims that they would have gotten more devotees by being a bigger being. But we know why the Pale King did this, and that was because they were dying and worms like him shed their skin as a form of rebirth. So four-fifths of this DLC is spent listening to this being berate us over and over again, with the last fifth having us listen to it try to come up with answers to questions we already know. Like I said, the actual storytelling here is questionable at best, and what makes matters worse is that this is the last time we will talk to the Godseeker, as in the next room is the Absolute Radiance, who upon its defeat will trigger the ending. I also want to clarify, this is an actual ending, not one like the Grim Troop where it's a DLC ending, I mean a proper endgame ending as it sends you back to before you completed the Pantheon, just like the main game sends you back to before you beat the Hollow Knight, and you also get a thank you from Team Cherry and a completion screen just like the main game too. This is an actual ending to Hollow Knight's story, and that's my biggest gripe with this DLC, because in what way is this tied to the events of the game? The only items required to beat this DLC are the Dream Nail, which is needed to enter the God Home, and the Void Heart, which we need to start the final Pantheon. These are the only items you need, which aren't locked behind any of the Dreamers or the Hollow Knight meaning you can get an official ending to the game Hollow Knight without ever interacting with the Dreamers or defeating the boss in which the game is named after. Now technically, we do fight the Hollow Knight and the Radiance in the Pantheons, but we are also in the Dream Realm that's also partially in the mind of a being who locked itself in a coffin at the bottom of the city sewers. We couldn't be further from the Hollow Nest if we tried. Then there's also the fact that Godseeker mode is canon, somehow, as it takes place after the ending, as the Godseeker becomes uncomfortably hard to listen to, given that they see us as their new god of gods. Even though, as we're about to see, we either kill the Godseeker, or teleport away from the kingdom, neither of which make a whole lot of sense to me outside of the fact that they have now gone from dick riding the Radiance to dick riding us. Furthermore, this all circles back to my earlier comment about what made Hollow Knight's main story so interesting, as that sense of exploration is gone here. We don't explore anything besides this one room, we only talk to one NPC, and the only things we fight or find are bosses that we've already met. It's everything that the main game is not, and the fact that this DLC has an official ending yet doesn't require the player to actually engage with the main game in any way is the cherry on top here. As for the endings themselves, they're basically the same but change depending on if you gave the Godseeker the delicate flower. This is something that we can get from Zamir in the resting grounds. Originally, we're supposed to plant it at the grave of their lover, which is the traitor lord's child. But once that happens, it sprouts, allowing us to give it to more NPCs. The first one you should definitely give it to is the Elder Bug, who is extremely delighted to receive it and will keep it with him forever. But we can also give this to the Godseeker. 
This changes the ending, as without it, the knight becomes a void entity that the community has called the Shade Lord and completely destroys the Radiance. But this entity is now running loose in the God Home and takes the opportunity to cover the God Seeker in void and presumably kill it. But if it has the flower, it's able to protect the God Seeker and instead teleports it and possibly the Shade Lord away to an unknown destination. Zamir and a couple NPCs tell us that the flower comes from an unknown place far away from here, so maybe this will get touched upon in Silk Song, but for now we're unsure of its true power. Either way, the Radiance dies in both endings, meaning the infection is gone as the veins around the Egg Temple lose their orange color. It also seems to have reverted anyone infected back to their original forms, as Hornet is seen walking its halls before being approached by a mysterious being that looks like the Hollow Knight judging by the curved mask and nail. This, in all fairness, did get me pretty excited, as the Hollow Knight possibly being alive and the Knight being the literal void itself is an interesting idea that I would like to see elaborated on in Silk Song but the methods that it took to get here were just not interesting enough for me to justify this. That's why I think the third ending with the original Radiance is better, as it feels like an actual conclusion. Everything makes sense. We destroyed the Radiance at the source, saved Hollow Nest, and used our siblings to kill the Radiance. But in here we meet a random NPC, fought through an extremely tedious gauntlet of the same bosses for hours, and then the Knight kills the Radiance through this ritual, saves Hollow Nest, and then becomes the embodiment of the Void. Nothing really felt answered or resolved, and it arguably leaves more questions than answers, which is not uncommon for endings like this, but it is possible to make an ending that resolves the current game while setting up the next one, and that's exactly what Ending 3 did. The Godmaster endings just add more questions without any answers. I do like the Knight being a Void Entity, and I like the idea of the Hollow Knight and Hornet possibly teaming up, but all of that is complete speculation. Especially when you consider that Silk Song takes place in a completely different kingdom, so that also begs the question of whether or not any of this will even be answered. To repeat what I said at the top of this section, The Godmaster is a tale of two extremes. Gameplay-wise, it's some of the best content in the game, and I can easily see myself sinking more hours into this after I finish this video. Story-wise though, at best, it's mildly interesting, and at worst, I almost wish it didn't have a story tied to it. Its method of storytelling is tedious, the main NPC of the DLC refuses to elaborate on anything and barely interacts with the player at all, and the endings take away from the previous set of endings by making these the canon ones. In all fairness, it's not clear what endings are actually canon for Hollow Knight, but I find it odd that Team Cherry would just add new endings for no reason, especially after the main game is already out. They did this with the Grimtube DLC, but that was only for that DLC. These are official endings, which makes me believe that they had these endings in mind as the canon option since they were added in after the fact. And that's a real shame, as climbing the realm with our siblings and defeating the Radiance alongside Hornet and the Hollow Knight was a perfect ending to this game, and Godmaster kinda ruins that. Hollow Knight is a wonderful metroidvania with an extremely interesting story that has me very excited for Silk Song. Obviously, I was critical of a few key parts, but if my biggest complaint was one DLC, I think we're in good hands here. Plus, that's also just one small slice of this incredibly large game. That's also not even considering the fact that this was free, too. Team Cherry not only charged $15 at most for this game, but never asked for another cent more after its release. Which is kind of insane to me, given that this game needed money via Kickstarter to even exist. I honestly would not have been surprised had they asked for money for these DLCs, but Team Cherry refused and it shows the amount of passion they have for this game. They couldn't have made this game without its backers, and not only did they want to make sure that they and their future buyers were happy with their purchase, they also wanted to pay homage to those that gave this game the legs it needed, as littered all throughout the game is backer-created content. Bosses like the God Tamer and all the Warrior Dreams were initially created by fans. NPCs like Cloth, Emilitia, and Tiso were backer-created content and there's an entire location called the Spirit's Glaive which serves as a cemetery for Hollow Nest that also has loads of bugs created by the backers. Regardless of my thoughts on the quality of those NPCs or bosses, the mere concept of having your creation put into a game is extremely cool, and the fact that Team Cherry was willing to do this on multiple occasions shows how much passion they have for the game and their community. I can say without a doubt that this is the best $15 you'll ever spend in your life, as there is enough content here to make it easily worth your purchase. And even if you play this game one time, Hollow Knight's story will easily be able to captivate you the same way it did to me. Exploring Hollow Nest was a joy, and going through a new area always felt like a fresh adventure, as I wonder what would be around the corner. Would it be a boss, an NPC, an item, a lore tablet? I didn't know, but I was always eager to find out. Hollow Knight is at its best when it has you wanting more, which may have had the unintended side effect of me wanting a bit too much, as the wait for Silk Song now begins. If the trailers are anything to go off of though, Silk Song is shaping up to be a beautiful entry in this series. I don't know when it's going to come out, but like the siblings of the Abyss, I'll be waiting patiently in the dark decrepit cave that is my room until release, hoping that unlike the Pale King, the team won't close it off from the rest of the world, 
never to be seen again. Thanks for watching. Thank you for watching today, and I hope you enjoyed. Many of you likely remember that I promised this video a while ago. I had some issues making it the first time around, but I'm glad it's finally done. Also, I want to shout out Lily who made this absolutely adorable piece of artwork for the announcement of the video. I highly recommend you check her out, especially if you're a fan art of anything related to the Souls games, as she has a ton of it. She was incredibly easy to work with, and I would definitely suggest you commission her for something if you got something in mind. As for the next video, well, given what I mentioned towards the beginning of this video, Blasphemous 2 is going to be up next. As for after, I'm not too sure, actually. There are quite a few new releases coming out that I'm quite interested in, but if you want to know ahead of time, make sure to follow me on Twitter. Regardless, like the video if you enjoy and subscribe if you're new. Thank you about returning viewers coming back to another video, and take care everyone. Goodbye.